Well, good afternoon, everyone. And um, there's a, been a bit of a life course theme uh, guiding the programme this afternoon. So we've heard about uh, mother and infants and children this morning, and now we're talking about ageing. Um, and the last question and the conversation that arose from that sort of fits very much uh, sort of leading into this topic. Are you? Is that better? Okay. I'll, sp I'll speak a bit closer to the microphone. Um, so, okay. So my choice of title slide is a, is a well, the, the image on my title slide is a deliberate one. Um, is that me? Possibly. It's a deliberate one. Um, uh, partly because I wanted a positive image of healthy ageing. Uh, where we tend to sort of think very much the opposite. It's from being a consultant, I've got too many phones. <laughs> uh, um, um, it's, um, uh, it's partly a positive uh, image of, of, of older people, uh, but also if you want a window of what our future looks like in our country in terms of demographic change, um, then you need to look to Japan. Um, you probably spotted that's where this from. Um, these people are taking part in a, an outdoor activity to celebrate respect for the aged day in Japan. I don't know if you could imagine having a respect for the aged day in the UK. Uh, I find that a little bit harder to visualise, which says something about my cynicism about attitudes to, to older people here. Um, but uh, here they are, um, uh, exercising, fending off frailty. Um, and, um, but they're what we would consider the young old, uh, they're only in their 70s. They're quite possibly looking after elderly parents. Um, so they may well have parents in their late 90s and possibly their hundreds. Um, and they're quite possibly looking after grandchildren or great-grandchildren if they're not geographically separated from them too much. Um, although those grandchildren will be reduced in numbers because one of the things that feeds an expanding um, older generation, an ageing population, is a drop in birth rate. Um, so... Uh, the other thing to say about uh, this is they're quite possibly still in the workplace. Uh, workforce participation in the 65 to 70 age group um, in Japan, um, a half of men and a third of women are still in the workplace. Uh, my first patient this morning in clinic um, retired at 75 only because he had to pay to renew his own HGB licence. So the idea of possibly having a retirement nearer 80 is possibly not so far-fetched. So what I've proposed to do is talk about what was a very broad general um, title in very broad general terms. Um, and that's partly out of humility, uh, because here we are at the end of the winter season uh, when the focus has very much been on the elderly, about bed occupancy, about discharging people from hospital. And I don't have a pithy one-line solution for that, although we will talk about some of these sort of themes. Um, but also um, really just to highlight the importance of the topic. Um, too often, uh, the, the, the subject of an ageing population is framed in pejorative terms. Um, we hear about a demographic time bomb. We hear about a, 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 an, age, an age quake uh, or a big grey cloud looming on the horizons, threatening to swallow us up. But of course, that grey cloud is us in 10, 20, 30 years' time. And actually, I would say that an ageing population is one of the signature achievements of the 20th century, initially fed by a massive reduction in child mortality, um, but now as a tribute to uh, public health, uh, tackling infectious diseases, uh, education, improved life chances, people are all living longer. And I think that's something better to be proud of than filling our oceans with plastic um, and ushering in an extinction of most of the species on the planet. So to paint a picture to understand our ageing population, hopefully you can see these graphs. I don't know how well they project. The graph at the top is a reduction in birth rate, and the brown line at the top is actually uh, the least developed countries in the world. So even in the least developed countries, the average family size is 2.5 children and reducing. Um, but what you'll notice on the bottom slide is the trend to increasing life expectancy. Now, it might be an assumption that at some point, some biological imperative would mean that that line begins to tail off. Uh, the human body is finite, 
uh, and you'd expect uh, the curve to reach something more horizontal. Uh, but the, the trend that has been a surprise over the last 10 years is that life expectancy is in increasing in a very steadfastly linear way. And um, as, as we've said just a moment ago, the children born today, a quarter to a third of them will probably reach their 100th birthday, uh, which, is, which is something to think about. Now, any major demographic change will pay, pose sort of social and economic challenges for its population. But how that plays out, particularly for the health sector, um, and, and also in terms of our own qualities of life as we get older, will be how much of that extra time is spent in health. So health expectancy, the extra years that are spent um, in good health, in successful ageing, will be important. That's actually one of the trickiest areas to make projections for. Um, the Office of National Statistics has suggested that in recent years, actually healthy ageing seems to be keeping on track roughly with increase of life expectancy. Um, but it's uncertain. We don't know how uh, obesity and other sort of public health issues are going to play out in the years ahead. And it's methodolo methodologically very difficult to make this sort of prediction. But what is clear is the disadvantage that comes uh, from social disadvantage. And I again, I hope this projects well enough. Um, but what you've got here are graphs showing um, life expectancy and health expectancy depending on um, your social advantage or disadvantage for men and women. So if we translate that to a Kent situation, um, some of the longest lived electoral wards are actually around this hotel in uh, rural Maidstone. So at, on their 65th birthday, men can expect to survive another 27 years. If you live in Cliftonville, or in some of the more deprived areas of our county, you can expect another 14 years. That's a difference of over a decade, which dwarfs the difference between life expectancy between men and women. So what that shows is that the determinants of, the determinants of successful ageing in later life are social um, and have a lifespan element to it. And so um, uh, it's important to bear that in mind. Unfortunately, I don't know if this slide will project for you at all. I should have possibly magnified it a little bit more. But what I want to talk about in relation to this is the impact for spending on health as we go forward. There might be an assumption that if the older population expands massively, thank you very much, and we've lost UK off the bottom there, I think we can sort of uh, <laughs> scroll down a little bit. It's uh, Brexit, unfortunately. <laughs> There we go, we've uh, been reunited. Um, so um, so that you might assume that if uh, the population is growing, there'll just be an exponential increase in health spending and health costs. Um, the reality, when looked at over the last few years, seems to be rather different. And the major determinants of health spending are probably to do with things other than ageing, as we've seen the trends increasing over the last 20 years. Um, if you look at OECD countries, if you've seen an, an annual increase in health spending of about 3.5%, only 0.5% of that is attributable to ageing and an ageing population. Things like health technologies uh, and other, uh, other factors will have an influence and a bearing on that. Um, the other source of a red herring in terms of the cost of older people as they age is that we are at our most expensive for the health service when we're born and when we die. So a th quarter of the money spent on us will be spent in the last two years of our life whether we're 8 or 88. So it's going to be rather obvious that health spending is going to cluster in an older population. What makes things difficult with an ageing population is the fact that there will be fewer people in the workplace um, earning money and paying taxes to pay for that. So that's where the big challenge will come. And actually, some of the belt tightening that we've seen as part of austerity in the last few years will be part of reality as the, the, the demographic curve sort of gradually shifts. What I would say as an important focus for planning for an ageing population is it is an impetus to begin to think about planning health services and wider health and social services and in fact societal changes that are fit and tailored for elderly people. We had a very pertinent comment just as the last question about housing. Um, and actually the determinants of health and welfare for my patients are very much to do with things other than just purely health um, and that will be important too. Um, what this graph shows if you look to the far left um, with the larger figure is the biggest amount of financial implications for an ageing population is actually to do with our pensions rather than our health care costs and in fact even our long-term care costs as shown by that graphic from the Lancet. So if we can pan out again 
just so people can see that in the middle. So what are the main target areas? How can we structure our thinking about target areas to sort of prepare ourselves for an aging population? Um, many of you will obviously know David Oliver. I read his um, regular contributions to the BMJ every week, former National Clinical Director uh, for Older People. And in his King's Fund paid paper, uh, they produced this infographic a few years ago to show where we might target our energies. And a lot of it will be familiar territory, um, it's about reablement, it's about personalised care, it's about handling discharges, it's about thinking about how hospitals operate and how we keep people in the community. Very much the stuff that's been occupying everyone's minds, particularly over the last few months. Um, and obviously the basic guiding principle of a left shift of trying to move from expensive care in hospitals to proactive preventative care in the community. Um, what I'm not going to be able to do in the small amount of time remaining is to just trot through all of these individually. But I think what would be of interest, certainly, I think, is thinking about the preventative end. Item one, what do we need to do to help people age well and what actually works? Well, getting housing right, as was mentioned by the person who made the question earlier, will be one thing. And that's also a real opportunity, as was said, to integrate our highly segregated age apartheid communities. Um, a life course approach that emphasises input from the word go for children and at that early stage will influence the, the chances of people ageing successfully. And uh, these are outcomes partly informed by the Marmot report about big long-term things that can improve people's quality of life as they progress through the lifespan. So things like housing, jobs and work, being able to live in the right environment, um, having healthy schools and pupils that are set up to have healthy lifestyles as they get older. You've had a presentation this morning that I'm sorry to have missed about isolation, but obviously loneliness, and again, our very fragmented communities where elderly people don't get to mix necessarily with younger people will be important. And also influencing um, basic known factors that improve health outcomes, but not just in middle age, but in later life, where we know these things still have an impact, a third of people over the age of 65, between 65 and 75, are obese. Um, women over the age of 70, only 8% of them do enough exercise. And we know exercise probably has one of the biggest impacts on ageing successfully, fending off frailty, improving outcomes with chronic diseases. So these are areas that are important. I didn't think I could make a presentation about this topic without at least touching on health and social care integration, because that's obviously part of what this whole sort of day is probably uh, people are sort of actively thinking about this. These are the headline facts and figures from last year's um, uh, National Audit Office's report, um, and it illustrates some of the challenges that continue to persist. Uh, possibly a brief sort of take-home glance of that slide will show that we're sort of still not successful in getting people out of hospital, but we're possibly a little bit better at keeping people in the community. Um, one option to, uh, to think about things and have ideas and to innovate is to look outside our own bubble. And so I briefly wanted to touch on a model from the States that's been widely expanded. About 88 centres now operate the PACE approach, the programme for all-inclusive care of the elderly. Uh, grew out of the Onlock project in San Francisco uh, back in the late 70s, which was borrowed, ironically, from that time from the UK day hospital programme. And a lot of these elements here uh, will be familiar to you about integrated care. This is how my teams work with our colleagues in primary care and um, social services uh, to try and wrap around elderly people. Uh, but what has been achieved with this is pooled funding uh, for uh, 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 with social care and health care, with Medicaid and Medicare, pooling the resources for a target population of people who are at risk of entering care homes and challenging, challenging your efforts there. Um, obviously, the challenges that one faces with that kind of model are the same that challenge us with health and social care integration. It's about information governance, sharing information systems, um, aligning working practices, and, uh, you know, and not having false financial disincentives and incentives that make things difficult for ourselves. In the last few slides, I just want to run through a few examples of innovation. And I guess the themes that underlie these are partly about um, intergenerational projects 
about how projects done in other countries can be implemented here in the UK. And interesting, a lot of these took their route in Tokyo and Japan before being trialled in Europe and then in the UK. Uh, but also innovating about improving quality of care for people in very holistic ways. So I don't know if anybody in the audience has been uh, to the Van Hochave um, site in the Netherlands. I know some of my colleagues from East Kent Hospitals are probably here, and that influenced some of their thinking around their project work for the new uh, dementia campus down in Dover. Um, but this is an innovative um, uh, village small gated community village type environment for people with relatively advanced dementia who are quite vulnerable, who live in small um, extended family sized homes grouped according to their interests. So the, the panel on the right there is about how the different houses operate, people dress and are uh, interacted with by their 24 hour carers according to these themes. So whether people come from the Dutch East Indies, whether they were tradespeople, homemakers, and they can, there is a a cafe, there is a supermarket, and people can lead a normal life. It doesn't matter if you buy 20 uh, uh, tubes of toothpaste a week. All that can be sorted out. But the key thing is that you're having a normal life in a community, and the community comes into you. So people can access a cafe. Um, businesses come in and use the theatre. The community comes in and owns responsibility for its people with dementia, which is important. I don't know if anybody met, met the students um, from Oasis Academy in Sheppey over... Are the students still here or have they disappeared? I don't know if I can see them. Uh, people will have given this handout. I was once the old age psychiatrist for Sheppey and we struggled to get a dementia cafe up and running. And the students at the local academy have done it um, in the four years since I've been away, which is lovely to see. I didn't know about it because I've been out of the loop for a long time. But this is an example of cross-generational work to improve the lives of both parties. Um, and these two examples illustrate the same thing. So the multi-generational houses in Germany that have been implemented in now a Jewish nursing home in Clapham. Um, you have a care home um, or a day centre for older people. And what a bright idea to put a children's nursery in, in with it as well. You can only imagine how that would enhance the lives uh, of, uh, of older people and they can eat together, they do singing together, um, and all parties benefit from that. Um, the Humanitas Care Centre in Deventer in the Netherlands again, but this has been implemented now in um, Cambridge. Um, you've got a care home with empty rooms. Why just have them empty? Why not let them out to students? Don't charge the students rent, uh, but uh, bring them in, and all they have to do is spend 30 hours a month being good neighbours to the elderly people who live there, sorting out their access to Wi-Fi, being with them on the computer um, and blending generations that are normally far too segregated in our modern societies. So I've got some concluding thoughts here just on the final side. Um, and I guess what I, my sort of overarching uh, sort of summary would be that improving um, the outcomes for older people in an ageing population is about far more than just sorting out our health service. It's about wholesale societal changes um, but probably needing small projects and gradual incremental change to improve that. And in terms of appealing to attitudes, I think the biggest attitudes we need to uh, uh, sort of shift are ageism and our prejudices about what it mean, means to be old and um, uh, respecting our aged. 